section one of the sikh religion volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe life of guru gobind singh the tenth and last guru chapter one an account of the early years of guru gobind ra has already been given in the life of guru teg bahadur guru gobind ra after his father's death continued with even more diligence than before to prepare himself for his great mission he procured a supply of sharp pointed arrows from lahore and practised archery with great industry the guru's principal companions and bodyguard at this time were his aunt viro's five sons sango shah jit mal gopal chand gangaram mahri chand his uncle suraj mal's two grandsons gulab ra and sham das kripal his maternal uncle by dayaram the friend of his youth and by nan chand an upright and favourite masand the descendants of the gurus the masands and the sons and grandsons of those who had served guru gobind ra's father and grandfather gathered round his standard he also entertained a number of singers who sang the guru's hymns and a number of bards who composed and sang in succession quatrains in praise of the gurus so great was the enthusiasm that the women of the city used to climb the top stories of the houses and chant the guru's praises in extempore verses a man called bikaya residing in lahore went to visit the guru bikaya seeing him handsome and well proportioned thought he would be a suitable match for his daughter jito the guru's mother was pleased at bakaya's proposal and asked her brother kripal to advise the guru to accept it the guru did so and there were great rejoicings at anandpur on the occasion of the betrothal great too were the rejoicings of bakaya's domestic circle when he returned home with the good news the twenty-third of har sambat seventeen thirty four a d sixteen seventy seven was fixed for the marriage and bakaya returned to anandpur to inform the guru of the glad day and invite him to proceed with his marriage procession to lahore the guru contrary to the custom on such occasions refused to go to lahore and said he would make a lahore near anandpur for the occasion he sent written orders in every direction for assistance and his wishes were amply gratified the sikhs thronged from the punjab capital on the occasion and with them came bakaya and his family shopkeepers and merchants opened shops and warehouses and abode in anandpur until the completion of the nuptial ceremonies after the marriage bakaya remained some time with the guru and performed all possible service for him the guru according to the custom of his predecessors used to rise in the end of the night and perform his devotions he particularly delighted to listen to the asa kai war after daybreak he gave his sikhs divine instruction and then practised martial exercises in the afternoon he received his sikhs went shooting or raced horses and ended the evening by performing the divine service of the rahiras once in the hot season when bathing with his cousins and other youths of the same age in the satluj the guru divided the party into two opposing factions to play a game of splash-water the guru being endowed with superior strength reduced his cousin gulab ra to such straits that he with difficulty emerged from the water in his confusion he began to put on the guru's turban believing it was his own by sango ran to restrain him for it would be a sacrilege for any one to put on the guru's turban gulab ra accordingly laid it down in consternation the guru saw the occurrence and begged gulab ra to bind the turban on his head and it would some day obtain him honour when in after days the guru had to leave anandpur for the dakhan 
gulab ra obtained possession of the city and established himself as sikh priest there thus fulfilling the guru's prophecy the guru delighted to wear uniform and arms and practice and induce others to practice archery and musket shooting his handsome exterior was much admired both by men and women one day as he was seated in darbar some new converts to the sikh faith came to do him homage among them was a sikh who had a daughter called sundari of marriageable age he proposed to the guru to wed her and make her the slave of his feet the guru did not desire the alliance but it was pressed on him by his mother and not long afterwards the guru's nuptials were solemnized we have already seen that raja ram of assam implored guru teg bahadur's intercession for a son and a prince called ratan ra was duly born to him raja ram died when his son was only seven years old when ratan ra attained the age of twelve he felt an inclination to see the son of the guru by whose mediation he had been born he accordingly with his mother and several of his ministers proceeded to anandpur he took with him as an offering five horses with golden trappings a very small but sagacious elephant a weapon out of which five sorts of arms could be made first a pistol then by pressing a spring a sword then a lance then a dagger and finally a club a throne from which by pressing a spring puppets emerged and played chopar a drinking cup of great value and several costly and beautiful jewels and raiment the raja was received in great state he offered his presents prayed the guru to grant him the sikh faith and sincerity so that his love might be ever centred in the guru's feet the guru granted all his desires the raja exhibited the excellence and advantages of all his presents he showed how five weapons could be made out of one he unloosened the puppets from the throne and set them playing chopar he caused the elephant to wipe the guru's shoes and place them in order for him the guru at the raja's suggestion discharged an arrow the elephant went and fetched it the animal held a jug of water from which the guru's feet were washed and then wiped them with a towel at the word of command he took a chauri and waved it over the guru at night he took two lighted torches in his trunk and showed the guru and the raja their homeward ways in due time the raja bade farewell to the guru and on his departure requested him never to let the elephant out of his possession several men went to the guru for enlistment and his army rapidly increased he now set about the construction of a big drum without which he deemed his equipment would be incomplete the work was entrusted to nan chand when the masands found that it was nearly ready they said that when bim chand the king of the country heard it he would be wroth and not suffer the guru and his sikhs to abide in the locality afraid however to make a representation to the guru himself they went to his mother gujari and expressed their sentiments the guru's expenditure on works of charity and philanthropy is already great and now he is increasing his army and building a large drum when the hill chiefs hear it beaten they will regard it as a symbol of conquest and engage in battle with the sikhs he is daily adding to the number of his soldiers be pleased o lady to restrain him this speech convinced the guru's mother she sent for her brother kripal and begged him to dissuade her son from completing the drum kripal said he could not take it on himself to make any such representation to the guru she must do so herself she accordingly spoke to her son next morning in the terms used by the masands to her she added our business is with religion for which humility is required even if thou complete the drum beat it not in public the guru replied mother dear how long shall i remain in concealment i am not going to take forcible possession of the hill rajas territories if they are jealous for nothing and allow their hearts to rankle i cannot help it this is the guru's castle where men shall obtain their deserts 
on this the guru rose and went to inquire if the drum were ready if not its completion must be expedited the masands then made a direct representation great king first consider the resources of the enemy they are kings and possess armies wealth and munitions of war it is therefore not advisable to contend with them what a number of troubles befell thy grandfather in his military career wherefore thou hast need of peace our guru's business is with the sikhism of his country war is the role of kings the guru replied how shall i conceal myself from those hill men i have received the immortal god's order to disclose myself and you tell me to remain in concealment i must obey god's order not yours i have prepared the drum because my army would have no prestige without it even if bim chand raja of kalur and the other hill rajas grow angry are we who sit here women we too shall meet sword with sword if they keep the peace so shall we we shall soon see what the hillmen intend when we go hunting we shall take the drum with us and beat it aloud on arriving at the base of the mountain the guru celebrated with prayers and the distribution of sacred food the completion of the big drum which he called ranjit or victorious on the battlefield when it was beaten the men and women of the city went forth to behold it and there was great rejoicing the guru and his men in full panoply went hunting the same day when the party arrived near bilaspur the capital of kalur the guru's drummer beat the drum with much energy and ostentation it sounded like thunder to the hillmen who at once apprehended that some potentate had come to take possession of their country raja bin chan consulted his prime minister who said it is guru gobind ra the tenth guru in succession to guru nanak who hath arrived his father purchased some land at the base of the tung mountain and built a village thereon thousands of worshippers come to him from great distances it is only recently that the raja of assam came to visit him and presented him large offerings he hath constructed a drum and come shooting here my advice is to keep on good terms with him in the first place he is worthy of worship secondly he maintaineth a large army and is greatly feared thirdly he is very brave and such men are sometimes useful as allies on hearing this raja bin chand determined to go to meet the guru and dispatched his prime minister to arrange for the interview the minister informed the guru that his master who was the head of all the hill chiefs desired to meet him and it would be well for the guru to be on good terms with him bhai kripal the guru's uncle at a nod from the guru replied this is the guru's castle as any one treateth him so shall he be treated if any one come here with good intentions he shall be well received but if he come as an enemy he shall be treated accordingly for men to be on good terms with one another is very expedient and commendable wherefore go and bring your raja we shall receive him with great respect the minister taking with him a robe of honour the guru's gift returned to his master and recommended him to proceed immediately to the interview the raja accordingly went with his courtiers and escort to anandpur raja bim chand was received in darbar with great honour by the guru who invited him to tell him the whole circumstances of the hill chiefs bim chand gave him the desired information and then prayed the guru to let him see the presents from the king of assam the guru at that interview showed him all the presents except the elephant next morning the guru had a costly tent erected which had been sent him from kabul by an enthusiastic sikh named duni chand and prepared to receive bim chand in it at the second interview with the guru were his relations courtiers and principal wrestlers and warriors when bim chand saw the kabuli tent he was astonished at its magnificence in reply to his inquiry he was told that it had cost two and a half lakhs of rupees and that it was the offering of a pious sikh during this conversation the elephant beautifully decorated was led forward bim chand expressed his unbounded admiration of all that he had seen and heard 
on his homeward journey his mind burned with envy of the guru's state and wealth and he considered how he could take possession of all his valuables on reflection however he came to the conclusion that he would be satisfied with the elephant and he determined to have the animal whether by force or stratagem on his arrival in his capital he unfolded his design to his courtiers and asked them to suggest how possession of the elephant could be obtained after some discussion it was agreed that a message should be sent to the guru to the effect that an embassy was coming from srinagar in the present british garwal district with the object of betrothing the daughter of its raja fatah shah to bim chand's son and bim chand desired to borrow the elephant so as to make a display of wealth to his guests it was accordingly decided that the guru should be requested to lend the elephant for the purpose when the guru received this message he knew that it was simply a trick to obtain per permanent possession of the animal he thought to himself if i refuse the elephant it means war and if i send him it also means war as i must resort to force for his recovery he accordingly replied to bim chand's message the raja who presented me with the elephant requested me not to let the animal go out of my possession and it is a principle of the guru's house to comply with such requests i have another elephant and should raja bim chand require him he may take him the messenger seeing that there was no chance of obtaining the desired elephant hastened to return to bilaspur the guru's message was delivered with the addition that he did not seem afraid of any of the hill chiefs raja bin chand much incensed consulted his prime minister who advised him not to provoke a quarrel with the guru bim chand angrily retorted and charged his minister with age and cowardice the guru had shown contempt for him and was he to calmly endure it upon this the minister advised his master to become a sikh receive initiation from the guru and all would be well bim chand replied i am an idolater i daily perform the tarpan and repeat the sandhya and the gayatri how can i forsake my religion and become a sikh of the guru in the first place i cannot as a hindu be on good terms with a man who hath discarded our holy faith secondly none of the hill rajas hath become a sikh and they would all laugh at me were i to change my religion they would say that i did it with the mercenary object of obtaining the elephant in the third place no men of high caste have joined the guru his followers are carriers barbers fishermen washermen sweepers and similar nondescript persons i am a great king of distinguished rajput ancestors how can i become the guru's follower and stand before him with clasped hands in supplication if he give me not the elephant by peaceable means i will take the animal by force the guru is already on bad terms with the emperor and if he fall out with me also he cannot abide here he is still a mere boy arms are new to his hands when i show him what i can do he will know who i am and renounce his pride saying this bim chand ordered his chief police officer to go to the guru and try to obtain the elephant by soft and persuasive words if these failed the guru was to be threatened with the strength of bim chand's army the police officer went on his mission and addressed the guru as directed the guru calmly replied thou givest one advice to me to lend the elephant and another to bim chand not to restore him upon this the police officer knew that the guru could divine the secrets of others and begged his forgiveness the guru then said tell the raja that if he have faith in the guru and if his intentions be honest the guru can grant him what he desireth but if he practise fraud and deceit the guru can protect his own interests the guru knoweth the secrets of men's hearts and thou canst not deceive him when thou talkest of the strength of the raja's army know that there is nothing wanting on the guru's side either 
the guru is already prepared for battle the sikhs are not women and they have had long practice in martial exercises the police officer departed and delivered this message to bim chand who decided that he would wait till the time had actually arrived for his son's marriage and then he would repeat his request for the elephant and add to it an application for the magnificent kabuli tent also End of section one section two of the sikh religion volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe life of guru gobind singh chapter two the guru continued to hunt and practice arms companies of sikhs used continually to visit him and make him offerings those who came for military service were received without reservation and taught the profession of arms in this way the guru soon collected a considerable army the masands continued their opposition and again went to complain to the guru's mother they represented to her the guru is very young and hath no worldly experience he hath stirred up strife between himself and the hill raja he hath no ally for the emperor beareth him no love he hath taken the unprecedented course of refusing on two occasions bim chand's request for the loan of the elephant these hill chiefs are not afraid to fight and die wherefore advise thy son that it is not politic to contend with them if war begin how shall sikhs come with their offerings and where shall we procure supplies for our public kitchen when the guru's mother remonstrated with him as thus advised he replied mother dear i have been sent by the immortal god he who worshippeth him shall be happy but he who acteth dishonestly and worshippeth stones shall receive well-merited retribution this is my commission from god if to-day i give Raja bim chand the elephant i shall have to pay him tribute to-morrow he essayeth to terrify me but i only fear the immortal god and know none beside nan chand then joined in the conference lady hath a lion ever feared jackals hath any one ever seen the light of the firefly in bright sunshine what availeth a drop of water in comparison with the ocean the guru is a tiger brave and splendid as the sun shall he fear bim chand when the foolish hillmen who are like mosquitoes contend with the guru they shall become acquainted with our strength and suffer the mortification of a late repentance by kripal then interposed sister dear nan chand understandeth the guru's pleasure the guru ended the discussion by saying mother dear heed not the evil advice of the masands they have become cowards from surreptitiously eating the offerings of the sikhs the guru knowing nan chand to be brave and skilful in war made him his finance minister moreover nan chand's father had done service for guru teg bahadur and the family was known to be loyal to the gurus pay was due to the troops and tact and skilful management of them were necessary kripal accordingly highly approved of the guru's resolve and accepted nan chand as the guru's finance minister nan chand was invested with a robe of honour and appointed to his high position with all do formalities the guru and his troops continued to practise archery and devote themselves to the chase when the other hill rajas heard of this and of the guru's difference with bim chand they began to fan the flame of enmity thinking that they would be more secure themselves if the guru and bim chand exhausted their strength on contests with each other kripal the raja of kangra sent raja bim chand a message fear not i am with you the guru is raising an army thou oughtest consequently to be on thy guard against him there cannot be two kings in one state 
wherefore it is proper for thee to expel him with all expedition bim chand replied that peace was the best thing if it could be maintained otherwise he would welcome his friend's assistance and expel the guru raja kripal then with exquisite treachery sent the following message to the guru great king fortunate are we that thou hast come to dwell in this land i have heard that thou hast some disagreement with bim chand that fool knoweth not thy greatness assert thyself and bring him to reason by the sword i will be thine ally directly thine order reacheth me i shall be found fully prepared to this the guru merely replied this is guru nanak's house where men shall be treated as they deserve raja kripal's envoy took note of the guru's intelligence determination and material strength and on returning to his master informed him that the guru would certainly not yield to bim chand without a struggle the time for the marriage of fatah shah's daughter to bim chand's son was now approaching so bim chand decided to ask the guru again to lend him the elephant and other articles of display for the occasion he accordingly sent his brother-in-law kesari chand raja of jaswal and a brahman with orders to bring what he desired by all possible means they requested the guru to lend bim chand the throne the elephant the kabuli tent and the fivefold weapon the family priest promised that the loan should be returned with a present of four thousand rupees on this the guru said am i a shopkeeper that i should take hire for what i lend kesari chand remonstrated o guru thou livest by offerings thou art not a landowner thou hast no kingdom no fief from which thou mayest derive income and offerings of this description have doubtless often been made thee the guru on hearing this declined further parley and abruptly dismissed the envoys the masands again complained to the guru's mother the guru's action is impolitic bim chand's army will come and plunder anandpur the guru is still a boy and hath never seen real warfare though he ever babbleth of it at one time he saith we will destroy the oppressive turks again he saith i will give the whole country from lahore to peshawar as a kingdom to my sikhs advise thy son to cease uttering such irritating language his mother duly remonstrated with him my son why art thou stirring up strife send thy minister nan chand and thy uncle kripal to make peace otherwise an army of hillmen will attack us immediately whither shall we go if we are obliged to depart hence thy father purchased this land and came here to live in retirement and peace the guru replied the hillmen have now come to beg with the humility of goats but when they have received what they have asked for they will assume the bravery of tigers on this account why should we not take measures for our own safety mother dear if we now betray fear of them they will soon be ready to devour us they will only respect us when we show them the sword if thou show a stick to a barking dog he will fear to continue his barking we cannot remain subject to such people if they play the part of aggressors i will show them what the guru can do the immortal god hath sent me into the world to uproot evil and protect from tyranny the weak and oppressed on hearing this the guru's mother retired in sorrow to her apartment and the guru proceeded to don his arms and coat of mail when raja bim chand's envoys returned to their master they repeated the guru's message with marginal additions of their own bim chand became very angry and addressed the guru the following letter if thou desire to dwell in anandpur send the elephant quickly if thou agree not to this i will take an army plunder and assail thy disciples of both sexes expel them from the country and imprison thee to save thyself however from all these painful consequences thou mayest immediately depart from my state the guru on perusing this letter smiled and said to his friends i accept the alternative of war which he offereth me 
he sent bim chand a reply to this effect and ordered nan chand to make immediate preparation for defence when bim chand received the guru's letter he called his brother hill chiefs to a council of war and informed them of his negotiations with the guru he was himself he said for open hostilities raja kripal however counselled deliberation he urged thou hast now made all preparations for thy son's marriage and it is not time for war should any relation of thine be killed thy rejoicings will be changed unto mourning it is not well to die at a time of festivity or sing songs of joy at a funeral the other hill chiefs who were summoned to the council and also bin chand's prime minister were precisely of the same opinion the contemplated war was consequently adjourned raja kripal then suggested that when the bridegroom's party went to srinagar they should induce raja fatah shah to ally himself with them and take up arms against the guru meantime the guru himself was making all preparations to meet his opponents he caused it to be publicly known that he would be grateful to all who brought him arms and horses and his appeal met with a ready response raja madani parkash of nihan at this time sent an envoy to the guru with an invitation to pay him a visit he was sure the guru would be pleased to see the dun or valley par excellence which enjoyed a cool climate and afforded abundant sport ram ra the guru's relation dwelt there and found it a pleasant and agreeable residence the raja of nahan had heard that raja bim chand was at enmity with the guru but raja bim chand knew not the guru's greatness and would afterwards repent the raja of nahan also desired the guru's assistance which would be useful to him in time of need and accordingly warmly invited him to make a lengthened sojourn in his country the guru requested the envoy to wait a few days for an answer the masands were very pleased to hear of the raja of nahan's invitation and thought if the guru accepted it there would be an end of the quarrel between him and bim chand they induced the guru's mother to persuade him to visit the raja she told the guru that after some time spent in nahan he might return to anandpur after which she hoped there would be peace the guru accepted her advice and promised to start for nahan on the morrow by way of precaution he decided to take the whole of his trained army with him and ordered nan chand to make all necessary arrangements for the march on the morrow the guru caused his drum to be beaten as a signal for departure he set out accompanied by his minister nan chand his relations and five hundred udasi sikhs for the defence of anandpur he left suraj mal's two grandsons gulab ra and sham das with a suitable guard the guru's first march was to kiratpur where he visited the shrine of his grandfather guru har gobind after a few days further journey he encamped at the foot of the nahan mountain the rajah duly went to greet and welcome his distinguished guest he took him to his palace begged him to enjoy himself with the chase and meanwhile design and superintend the building of a fort for the protection of the state on one of the rajah's and the guru's hunting excursions the subject was again mooted the rajah explained that rajah fatah shah of srinagar the capital of garhwal had often quarrelled with him over the ground on which they were then standing he would therefore be very pleased when a fortress was constructed on the spot for protection against all enemies the guru erected a tent and in company with the raja held a darbar it was unanimously agreed that a fort was necessary for the protection of the country the raja accordingly requested the guru to allow his army to assist in its construction and he would send his own workmen and labourers for its speedy completion the guru caused sacred food to be prepared and praying to the creator distributed it he then laid the foundation stone of the fort such was the zeal and energy of the workmen that it was completed in twelve days the guru gave it the name of ponta 
he abode there and continued to increase his army and enlist all mohammedans as well as hindus who presented themselves for service all recruits as well as disciplined soldiers rendered willing aid in the construction of the building end of section two section three of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain the life of guru gobind singh chapter three ram rai of dehra dun heard of the guru's visit and of the construction of payanta which was only about thirty miles distant from his residence he apprehended that the guru had come to punish him for his previous misdeeds and he communicated his suspicions to his masands gurdas who had accompanied ram rai to dili when sent there by guru har rai and who had remained with him ever since urged that guru gobind rai was not so vindictive and base as to take revenge if however he manifested any signs of aggression gurdas's brother tara who was a warrior and skilful archer would be able to oppose him and protect the city of dehra dun ram rai replied that no one could contend with the guru in archery even bim chand hid himself in his castle through fear of the guru's arrows should the guru decide to take action against them whither should they go for refuge gurdas rejoined that if ram rai fled before there was even a semblance of an attack there would be several tales circulated to his discredit the guru subsequently hearing of his anxiety and wishing to remove it sent nan chand and daya ram to reassure him ram rai on receiving the guru's message was delighted invested the envoys with dresses of honour and decided to remain on friendly terms with the martial son of guru teg bahadur budu shah a Sayyid, who lived in sandara went with his disciples to pay a visit to the guru and make him offerings budu shah represented himself as a great sinner said that he should certainly have to render an account of his transgression hereafter and why should he not be pardoned now by the guru's mediation the guru replied thou shalt not have to render an account hereafter guru nanak hath procured thy pardon budu shah remained for some time with the guru who conceived a great affection for him and vouchsafed him religious instruction suitable to his circumstances raja fatah shah of srinagar in consultation with his ministers arrived at the conclusion that it would be politic to be on good terms with the guru and accordingly decided to visit him since he had approached so near his territory when the guru was apprised of his intention he prepared a magnificent entertainment for his reception rich carpets were spread and minstrels engaged to contribute to the raja's amusement and enhance his enjoyment of the feast during the raja's visit the guru sent his uncle kripal to him to suggest that it would be well if he and the raja of nahan also were on good terms the raja at once replied that he would act in all such matters as the guru desired the guru then sent for the raja of nahan he came and promised to forget his former enmity to the raja of srinagar the guru brought the two rajas together in open court caused them to embrace and promise eternal friendship before the assembly was dissolved a hillman arrived with tidings of a fierce tiger which was destroying cattle in the neighbourhood the messenger pressed the guru to free the country from the pest the guru on the morrow took the two rajas together with nan chand and others to where the tiger was reported to have his lair the guru asked the hillman who had brought the intelligence to lead the way he guided the guru and his party into a very dense forest the tiger which had been resting awoke on hearing the tramp of the huntsman's feet and sat on his haunches looking at his pursuers with tranquil curiosity the guru forbade a bullet or arrow to be discharged and called on any one who deemed himself brave to engage the tiger with sword and shield no one came forward in response to the challenge raja fatah shah addressed the guru great king this tiger is very strong 
and hath been for a long time in this forest he hath destroyed several men and cattle if any one had been able to cope with him would he still be alive but as he is strong and thou too art mighty why not engage him thyself who but thee hath prowess to contend with sword and shield hearing this the guru alighted from his horse and drew himself together for the attack the raja of nahan interposed o true guru why confront such a tiger we will shoot him with our matchlocks the guru replied see how i will deal with this tiger i shall have no difficulty in killing him saying this he took sword and shield advanced and challenged the tiger the tiger rose with a roar and sprang at the guru the guru received him on his shield and striking him on the flank with his sword cut him in twain the rajas and the hunting party were naturally astonished and delighted at the guru's strength and bravery and the result of the encounter the guru took the opportunity to instruct his friends the tiger hath died like a hero and obtained deliverance it is cowards who suffer transmigration the brave enjoy celestial happiness if a man die in battle it should be with his face to the foe next morning the two rajas leaving the guru in paunta departed to their several capitals on budu shah's return to his home in sad ara five hundred pathans in uniform presented themselves before him one morning they stated that they had been soldiers of the emperor aurangzeb but for some trivial offence had been disbanded no one would now receive them through fear of the emperor it occurred to budu shah that the guru who had no fear of anybody would be likely to accept their services in his army he accordingly took them to the guru who was delighted to enlist them the guru fixed a salary of five rupees per day for each officer and one rupee a day for each trooper the officers names were hyat khan kala khan nayabat khan and bikan khan men of whom we shall hear much hereafter an envoy about this time arrived from ram rai when he was allowed to approach the guru on the morning after his arrival he saw the guru's troops some fencing some practising archery and others performing miscellaneous military exercises the envoy told the guru that ram rai desired to meet him but could not go to paunta and did not desire the guru to come to dara dun they could meet at some intermediate spot ram rai had then a large following and did not desire that his disciples should think he went as an inferior to the guru but at the same time he never hoped that the guru would proceed to visit him hence his unusual request the guru consented to meet him on the margin of the jamna on sunday the second day of the following month the interview accordingly took place when ram rai's companions saw him touch the guru's feet they said see ram rai does obeisance to his rival and they made many remarks derogatory to the rank arrogated to himself by their spiritual guide the guru and ram rai conversed on various matters particularly on the guru's relations with raja bim chand at the end of the colloquy ram rai said i am fortunate to have obtained a sight of thee i have now but a brief time to live my masands are very proud when i am gone protect my family and property thou art the son of our race and hast for many reasons assumed birth the holy guru nanak made the name of the one god the sole raft to ferry mortals over the world's ocean and by means of it men have obtained deliverance but when in time the wind of evil passions blew the raft striking on the rock of pride was foundered and many souls were lost my father guru har rai used to say that some one would be born from our family who would restore and refit the vessel for the safe conveyance of souls accordingly thou hast come into the world for this special purpose when the guru after hearing this looked round he saw all ram rai's men standing with their backs towards him and their master the guru then observed ram rai's sikhs who turn their backs on us are fools they are not pleased with the sight even of their own guru so he will not render them assistance hereafter 
the guru by his occult power knew gurdas's boast that his brother tara would be a match for him and protect ram rai's city against any aggression he might meditate the guru accordingly said to gurdas tell thy brother to discharge an arrow in my presence thou saidst that thy brother could shoot like the guru and that no guru could be so powerful as he gurdas on thus being taken to task begged the guru's pardon and was duly forgiven the guru then returned to paunta where he abode for a time composing poetry in its pleasant environment and salubrious climate the offer of the suraj parkash gives the method of the guru's composition he used to rise early bathe walk along the bank of the river jamna sufficiently far to obtain complete privacy and ensure himself against interruption he would then sit down and compose poetry for three hours he first translated from sanskrit the history of krishan avatar the translation is generally in quatrains adorned with similes and metaphors the guru delighted to describe the sports of krishan the circular dances performed by him and the milkmaids and his special devotion to radhika his queen it was further to the south on the margin of the same river that krishan disported himself and performed those great feats which have secured him deification among the hindus the guru in his ras mandal or description of the circular dance of krishan made an acrostic out of the thirty-five letters of the garamukhi alphabet the letters do not begin but end the verses at intervals in his literary labour he used to watch the river rolling over its shingly bed and admire its sparkling foam and blue wavelets some time after the guru's visit ram rai fell into a trance and in that state was cremated by the masands in defiance of the prayers and entreaties of his wife punjab kaur the masands then proceeded to take possession of his property and of the offerings intended for him and each began to proclaim himself guru punjab kaur through the agency of gurdas who had remained faithful to her sent a letter to guru gobind rai to inform him of the circumstances and to pray for his advice and assistance she then invited all the masands to a feast on a certain day which she had fixed on for the appointment of a successor to her husband and promised to the deserving dresses of honour on the occasion when the masands arrived they each presented a claim to spiritual authority one man would say i want to be appointed guru of a certain country another would say i want to be appointed guru of another country when all the masands had arrived punjab kaur sent to inform the guru the guru at once ordered his troops to prepare for an expedition on the morrow he proceeded with them to dera leaving sufficient men to guard paunta when the masands saw the guru their faces grew pale and they asked one another why he had come the guru and ram rai they said were in opposition to each other but perhaps the guru had come to condole with the widow on her husband's death in any case the masands made certain that the guru would only stay for a day or two as punjab kaur would be unable to provide supplies for him and his army for any length of time next day punjab kaur requested the guru to punish the masands some of them suspected what was in store for them but fate was too powerful to allow of their absconding the guru recalled to memory all their crimes and misdemeanours they used to go to the houses of sikhs to take intoxicants and frequent the society of courtesans they used to boast that the guru was of their own making and if they did not serve him no one would even look at him they practised oppression in every form they embezzled offerings made to the guru and committed many other enormities the guru accordingly meted out condign punishment to the guilty among them and rewarded those who had remained faithful to punjab kaur he then returned to paunta end of section three section four of the sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain 
life of guru gobind singh chapter four the guru set about extending panta and beautifying it with gardens and pleasure grounds one day as he was sitting in his garden he received an invitation from raja fatah shah of srinagar to his daughter's marriage with the son of raja bim chand of bilaspur the guru declined the invitation on the ground that bim chand was at enmity with him and a disturbance might result were the two to meet the guru however promised to send his finance minister with some troops to represent him he accordingly gave orders to diwan nan chan to hold himself in readiness and at the same time to provide a necklace of the value of one lakh and a quarter of rupees as a marriage present for raja fatah shah's daughter nan chand on his departure said to the guru i go in obedience to thine order but if raja bim chand force a quarrel on me it may be difficult for me to return the guru replied as the immortal god will take thee thither so will he restore thee to me have no anxiety on that account nan chan set out according to order with five hundred horse for srinagar the raja sent officers some distance to receive him and offered him suitable quarters within the city nan chand urged diplomatic reasons for not accepting the accommodation provided but his real object was to encamp outside the city so that he and his troops might be free to escape if treacherously attacked accordingly a spot on the road to panta was at his request assigned him for his camp raja bim chand raja kesari chand raja gopal raja hari chand and the rajas of kangra mandi and sukit proceeded in great state to srinagar on their way they halted on the margin of the jamna not far from panta there raja bin chand heard that the guru with his forces was encamped at the ferry of rajgat four miles distant and had made preparations to obstruct his progress bim chand accordingly considered what was to be done under the circumstances he knew the guru to be very brave and he also knew the enmity he bore him if raja bim chand went straight on he would have to contend with the guru's troops and if he went by a circuitous route to another ferry he could not arrive in time for the wedding in this difficulty raja bim chand consulted his brother rajas and recalled to their memory all the circumstances connected with his negotiations with the guru he had deferred making war on account of his son's approaching marriage but the very circumstance that he had apprehended now occurred for the guru was on the way to obstruct his progress and hinder his crossing the jamna at rajgat various counsels were given which were all rejected at last bim chand decided to send his prime minister to the guru to represent that his son's marriage was about to be celebrated and it was no time for a clash of arms which would turn joy into sorrow the prime minister received instructions to present all this in the form of a respectful request to the guru if it failed he was then to inform him of the names of the rajas who were with the marriage procession it was thus hoped that even if the guru rejected the respectful request he would hesitate to attack so many powerful chiefs when the hill raja's envoy reached the guru he said o oh, true guru raja bim chand with the hill raja's hath come with his son's marriage procession and they request thy permission to pass they ordered me to entreat thee with clasped hands to consider this as the marriage of thine own son the guru replied o oh, envoy there is no reliance to be placed on these false hill raja's while uttering sweet words they harbour enmity in their hearts therefore tell them from me that they may come this way if they are brave but if they are cowards they may take another route in which case i will not molest them raja bim chand threatened to come and attack me at anandpur i will myself proceed thither when i have vanquished him 
when the guru's determination was communicated to raja bhim chand and the other hill chiefs there ensued a long discussion as to the best course of action it was at last decided that the bridegroom should be sent with a few high officials to request the guru to allow him safe conduct for the purpose of his marriage and that the rest of the marriage procession should go to srinagar by a circuitous route bim chand vowed that after the celebration of the marriage he would take revenge on the guru for his conduct and bring raja fatah shah to dislodge him from his position when raja bim chand's son with his escort reached the guru he said o true guru thy name is cherisher of those who seek thy protection and i do so now had my father thought that thou wert likely to molest me he would never have sent me hither as i am his son so i am now thine i am altogether at thy mercy the guru compassionated the youth and at once allowed him to proceed to srinagar for the due performance of his marriage rites when the bridegroom and his small party informed raja fatah shah of what had occurred he felt sore grieved at the impediment placed by the guru in the way of his daughter's marriage before the hill chiefs had yet arrived diwan nan chand desired to offer the guru's wedding present and then take his early departure raja fatah shah replied you may offer me the guru's present when all the rajas are assembled when raja bim chand and the other hill chiefs arrived nan chand was anxious to present the guru's wedding gift and leave srinagar as early as possible the herald in attendance proclaimed guru gobind ray who is seated on guru nanak's throne hath presented jewellery to the value of a lakh and a quarter of rupees as dowry to fatah shah's daughter raja bim chand on hearing this became enraged and said witness all ye people my kerm is friendly to the guru and taketh the marriage present from him though he is an enemy of mine i must therefore refuse to accept fatah shah's daughter for my son the raja of kangra said to the speaker it is not well to act in haste send thy minister to raja fatah shah and ask him if he will take the initiative in a war with the guru if so he is one of us and we will conclude the alliance with him if however he refuse to attack the guru then we will not accept his daughter on this raja kasari chand and raja bim chand's minister went to raja fatah shah told him all the circumstances and said that if he did not go to war with the guru he should be considered an enemy not only of raja bim chand but of all the hill chiefs raja fatah shah was much perplexed on receiving this message and saw that trouble awaited him on every side he replied it is a great sin to fight with a man who obviously manifesteth his friendship the guru is my greatest friend how shall i engage in a conflict with him without reason raja bim chand is at enmity with the guru without any just cause if one man make a request and another cannot comply what ground of enmity is that come with me and i will make peace between the guru and raja bim chand when raja bim chand was informed of this he caused the drum of departure to be beaten when his horses were saddled and all preparation made he sent his minister with an ultimatum to fatah shah raja bim chand now breaks off his son's marriage with thy daughter on this account thou shalt suffer much obloquy the guru is here to-day and gone to-morrow thou hast no kinship to break with him so why break with thine affianced relations fatah shah was weakly overcome by this representation and promised to act as raja bim chand desired raja bim chand who was already on horseback alighted on hearing fatah shah's change of determination and went to him fatah shah then renewed his promise to act according to bim chand's wishes and join him in making war on the guru 
meanwhile nan chand managed to secure his property including the guru's unaccepted wedding present and prepared for his homeward journey on hearing this raja bhim chand sent five hundred horse to intercept him and seize whatever he had in his possession raja bhim chand promised the leader of the detachment to send more troops to his assistance as soon as possible when nan chand's troops found their way obstructed they began to reflect that they were few while the hillmen were many and they meditated flight or coalition with the enemy on this a brave sikh spoke out what are you soldiers meditating on your departure for srinagar the true guru promised that as the immortal god would conduct you to your destination so would he restore you to your homes in safety put faith in the guru's words this short speech inspired the sikhs with courage and shouting sat sri akal sat sri akal true is the immortal god true is the immortal god prepared for the conflict nan chand also addressed cheering words to his men he assured them that the army in front of them was weak and his men might fearlessly advance they obeyed and when within gunshot discharged a volley at the hillmen which threw their ranks into disorder nan chand then shouted to the hill troops why waste your lives in vain the army which was to reinforce you hath not arrived fly on hearing this the hillmen dispersed in every direction their reinforcing army which was approaching heard the sound of the sikhs muskets and feared to advance moreover raja bhim chand's troops would never fight unless commanded by himself the result was that nan chand and his troops safely returned to paunta and offered their obeisance and congratulations to the guru nan chand gave him an account of what had occurred since his departure for srinagar and advised him to hold himself in readiness for the hill rajas with fatah shah would certainly repeat their aggression upon this the guru ordered ammunition to be served out to his army it now became a question whether the guru would wait for the enemy near paunta or advance to intercept their progress the guru's uncle said that the enemy would come by bangani between the jamna and the giri and it would be best to select bangani which was six miles distant for the field of battle the guru approved of this plan of operations during nan chand's stay in srinagar a merchant arrived there with one hundred horses which he had purchased in cashmere for the guru nan chand had a difficulty in saving them from bim chand's rapacity and succeeded in taking them to paunta he now informed the guru that the horses were present and at his disposal the gift was a very opportune one and the guru expressed his highest satisfaction with the merchant he distributed the horses among selected sikhs there was nothing now heard but warlike preparations and conversations the sikhs who in the words of the sikh chronicler watched for the enemy as a tiger for his prey enjoyed in anticipation the approaching battle and vaunted that they would expel all the hill rajas and take possession of their territories raja bhim chand reproached his troops for failing to arrest the departure of nan chand's detachment and asked them if they had occupied their time in feasting on honey or doing their duty he said however that he would forget the past if they promised amendment in the future he then sent word to fatah shah to go and do battle with the guru according to his promise fatah shah in order to please him served out ammunition and beat the drum of war his soldiers buckled on their swords and slung their guns over their shoulders fatah shah propitiated the goddess of his state and putting himself at the head of his troops advanced to the combat 
as already stated the guru's army except the five hundred pathans recently taken into his service on the recommendation of budu shah exalted in the prospect of battle the pathans took counsel with one another and bakan khan one of their officers said the guru's main dependence is on us the rest of his army is a miscellaneous rabble who have never seen war and will run away when they hear the first shot fired then the brunt of the battle will fall on us and we shall be responsible for defeat why waste our lives in vain let us go to the guru and ask permission to return to our homes kala khan another of the pathan officers stoutly resisted the proposal you are untrue to your salt are you not ashamed to think of running away when your employer is involved in serious warfare nobody will trust you in the future and when you die you shall be condemned to the abode of sorrow of which our holy prophet tells you are a disgrace to the pathan race bikan khan rejoined o kala khan remain thou loyal to the guru if any of us have business at home why should he not go there why should he die an untimely death stay thou with the guru and earn such advancement as he may confer on thee on hearing this kala khan detached himself from the pathans and adhered to his allegiance to the guru nijabat khan and hayat khan sided with the majority under bakan khan and proceeded to the guru to ask on behalf of themselves and their followers leave to depart to their homes one man had a child born to him another was to be betrothed a third was to be married the mother of a fourth was dead etc etc and all would suffer irrevocable disgrace were they not to return to their homes at once they accordingly requested the guru to settle their accounts and pay the balance of their salaries due to them the guru replied this is not a time to ask for leave the enemy is upon us and yet you desire to forsake me if any one of you wish to marry let him first marry battle and then proceed to his home and celebrate marriage with his betrothed in that case i will largely reward you the pathans again represented it is incumbent on us to go to our homes in case of births deaths and marriages otherwise we could never show our faces again to our relations we must therefore depart to this the guru replied be loyal to your sovereign leave death and life in the hands of god desert not your posts abandon not your duty and you shall be happy in this world and the next if you die in battle you shall obtain glory to which not even monarchs can aspire shame not your sires and your race he who forsaketh his master in battle shall be dishonoured here and condemned hereafter the vultures knowing him to be disloyal will not touch but spurn his flesh he shall not go to heaven hereafter nor obtain glory here abundant disgrace shall light upon his head be assured of this that human birth shall be profitable to him who loseth his life with his face to the foe for all the drops of blood that fall from his body so many years shall he enjoy the company of his god the guru offered double pay which the pathans refused then triple then quadruple all the guru's overtures were rejected the pathans replied money is a thing to be distributed among relations but if relations fall out of what use is money kripal then addressed them o fools you are afraid to fight and are only inventing excuses having eaten the guru's salt you are untrue to it and are reflecting dishonour on the pathan race a curse on your pay and on yourselves kripal then quoted the text from bhai gur das's wars against ingratitude finding all remonstrance useless kripal recommended the guru to dismiss the wretches from his service the guru again addressed the mutinous men you appear like tigers but you have only the spirit of jackals the pathans cast down their eyes and said in reply o great king say what thou pleasest we will serve thee no longer we are not thy prisoners why tauntest thou us the guru replied leave my presence 
the immortal god will assist me when the pathans having received their salary from the guru went to their tents to make preparations for their departure kala khan again advised them to serve the guru for one year more at the end of that time they should be wealthy men bhikan khan replied the guru is evidently afraid of the enemy if we want money let us go and fight on the side of the hillmen and obtain their permission to plunder the guru the hillmen have not the same information regarding his treasure as we have accordingly we shall be at the rear during the battle and at the front during the plunder we will then go straight to our homes taking with us all we can seize this advice of bakan khan was applauded by the pathans they accordingly sent five of their men to negotiate with raja fatah shah and tell him they would all serve him without pay if they were allowed to plunder the guru moreover their leaving the guru would ruin him as they were the only fighting men he had in fact on their departure there would be none to fight on his side and fatah shah would gain a bloodless victory fatah shah was highly pleased and at once gave the pathans written permission to appropriate the guru's property when the document was shown to the body of the pathans they set about saddling their horses to join fatah shah's standard kala khan again remonstrated and threatened the mutineers but in vain some further overtures of the guru were also rejected the upshot was that the guru's soldiers who were only waiting for his order expelled the mutinous pathans from his camp kala khan remained with the troop of one hundred men of whom he had been originally in command the guru lost no time in informing budu shah of the misconduct of the mutinous pathan soldiers whom he had introduced and recommended to him budu shah felt their behaviour a personal disgrace to himself he sought to remove it and also gain spiritual advantage by assisting the guru he accordingly placed himself his brother his four sons and seven hundred disciples at the guru's disposal end of section four section five of sikh religion volume five by max arthur mcauliffe this librivox recording is in the public domain the life of guru gobind singh chapter five when the pathans joined raja fatah shah he asked them what the guru whose pay they had been receiving and whose salt they had been eating must think of them after their desertion bhikan khan replied great king the guru is greatly afraid of thee he only declared war on thee through reliance on us he offered us shields full of rupees but we refused and came to thee he hath only eight men who know how to fight these are his five cousins his uncle kripal diwan nan chand and bai daya ram the others who are with him are the dregs of the populace and know not even how to handle a sword we pathans shall be too many for them so it will not be necessary for thy troops to engage at all the guru hath treasure exceeding that of an emperor on this fatah shah remarked that providence was kind to him in having already granted him victory he repeated his promise to the pathans that they might go and plunder the guru and if he himself possibly could he would generously reward them out of his own resources also the guru's scouts who had been sent to bangani reported that the enemy were marching to the attack he must therefore proceed at once to intercept them otherwise they would enter panta on the morrow the guru sent orders to a body of udasis to put on their turbans take their arms and prepare for defence the udasis too did not wish to lose their lives they said that there were other countries where they might beg for their living and that the guru's kitchen from which they used to eat was not the only one in the world which remained to them 
it was not for the purpose of fighting they had left their homes and become pilgrims they accordingly resolved to abscond during the night one by one so that their departure might be unobserved next morning the guru was informed that the udasis had all fled except their mahant kripal who remained in a state of abstraction the guru smiled and said the root at any rate is left and since there is the root the tree shall bear blossom and fruit if the mahant had gone the udasis would have been totally extirpated and excommunicated from sikhism the guru then ordered the mahant to be sent for and thus addressed him o mahant whither have thy udasis fled hearken to me thy disciples eat our sacred food but when they see a green field elsewhere they go to graze on it like cattle they have all absconded in the present hour of need the mahant calmly replied all disciples of the gurus are made by thee and thou thyself canst pardon them while the guru was conversing with the mahant two sikhs arrived to report that the army of the hillmen had arrived near bangani the guru gave orders to his five cousins to take troops and stop the entrance of the enemy into the town then making all arrangements for the defence of ponta during his absence he sent for his arms and armour and offered the following prayer to the almighty eternal god thou art our shield the dagger knife the sword we wield to us protector there is given the timeless deathless lord of heaven to us all steals unvanquished might to us all times resistless flight but chiefly thou protector brave all steel wilt thine own servants save then while repeating his orders he buckled on his sword slung his quiver over his shoulder took his bow in his hand mounted his steed and shouting sat shri akal in his loudest voice proceeded to confront his enemies it is recorded that the hoofs of the guru's horse in their quick movement raised clouds of dust which obscured the sun and that the cheers of his men resembled thunder in the stormy and rainy month of sawan when the guru arrived at bangani bhai daya ram pointed out the positions of the armies arrayed against him behold there is fatah shah's army and to the right of it are the faithless pathans who have deserted us behind them all stands fatah shah himself in the van is seen hari chand the raja of handur a brave and accomplished archer meanwhile a contingent was seen to approach discharging firearms and committing great havoc among the hillmen diwan nan chand was puzzled and applied to the guru for information a soldier arrived in breathless haste and said that budu shah had arrived to wipe out the guru's taunts for having introduced the pathans to him the guru was of course overjoyed to receive budu shah with his reinforcement and at once gave the order to charge sango shah one of the guru's cousins who discharged bullets like hail and committed fearful destruction among the enemy is specially mentioned on this occasion for his conspicuous gallantry raja fatah shah soon learnt that the pathans had misled him as to the character and strength of the guru's army raja hari chand then suggested that the pathans under bakan khan being in the guru's secret and aware of his plan of operation should be sent to the front this was accordingly done they charged the guru's army and used their muskets with great effect the guru sent nand chand and daya ram with their troops to check their onset nand chand and daya ram advanced with the rapidity of arrows shot from the guru's bowstring they and their men discharged missiles like winged serpents against the enemy the pathans too fought well the battle was hotly contested and many brave men were untimely slain on both sides the struggle was continued by both armies with the eagerness of wrestlers striving for victory sango shah continued his brave career and killed many of the enemy he was well supported by his brother 
mari chand who showered bullets with deadly precision on the pathans but was at last surrounded as his missiles were exhausted sango seeing his brother's perilous position put his horse at full speed to rescue him and so deftly applied his arrows that the pathans soon surrendered their expected prey and fled budu shah his relations and his disciples fought with great bravery and devotion and succeeded in slaying numbers of the enemy the ground resembled a red carpet his men shouted like thunder and drove the enemy before them as a hurricane drives chaff raja gopal of guler now arrived with his troops to reinforce fatah shah he called out to the fugitives why run away i have come to your assistance on this the hillmen took courage and renewed the combat they directed their attack principally against budu shah's troops seeing this budu shah's sons fought with the greatest bravery felled the enemy as a woodcutter fells forest trees and warded off all return strokes so that they piled up corpses on corpses raja gopal seeing the destruction of his allies addressed his men my brethren now is the time for action maintain the honour of the hill rajas the result of this brief exhortation was that the enemy surrounded budu shah's son in this critical position he fought with great desperation his bravery attracted the attention of the guru himself who sent his uncle kripal with troops to rescue him kripal's men showered arrows and bullets on the enemy and succeeded in extricating the youth he and kripal then joined in a terrific charge on the hillmen raja gopal seeing this discharged an arrow at budu shah's son which struck him on the chest and brought him to the ground this led to a close engagement of the combatants on both sides for the possession of the body every form of weapon was plied and the carnage became terrific such was the gallantry of kripal and the spirit he infused into his followers that the enemy fled leaving the corpse of budu shah's son to be borne away from the field by his father's disciples for honourable interment raja gopal on seeing the confusion produced in his ranks by the brave kripal directed his horse at full speed against him as gopal advanced he discharged an arrow at him which lodged in his horse's saddle on this kripal shouted o oh, gopal thou hast had the first shot it is for me to shoot now on hearing this gopal turned his horse round kripal at once discharged an arrow which penetrated his horse's temple and the animal fell heavily on the ground gopal unhorsed ran away with the rapidity of a thief who finds day dawning on him in the exercise of his calling and took refuge at the rear of his troops he there provided himself with another steed which he mounted for the battle the rajas of chandal and handur now appeared on the scene and desired to come to close quarters with the guru himself they and their troops were however kept at bay by the bravery of the guru's five cousins supported by the faithful sikhs raja fatah shah now called out to bikan khan and his pathans and asked them why they were concealing themselves and saving their skins like dastards bikan khan had represented that the guru's army was worthless so fatah shah now called on him to put that worthless army to flight he and his men might then return to their homes with such plunder as they could obtain from their victory bikan khan thus roused from his lethargy joined in the fight hayat khan too advanced and killed several of the guru's troopers kripal the mahant of the udasis now advanced on horseback and asked the guru's permission to engage hayat khan the guru replied o holy saint thou canst kill him with thy words pray that i may be victorious kripal the guru's uncle overhearing this conversation and seeing that the mahant was filled with martial enthusiasm prayed the guru to let him engage hayat khan 
the guru inquired with what weapon the mahant was going to contend with his adversary the mahant replied with this club the guru smiled and said go and engage thine enemy it was a spectacle to see the mahant with his matted hair twisted round his head his body only clothed with a thin plaster of ashes and his belly projecting far in front of his saddle proceeding to engage a practised warrior armed with the latest weapons of destruction when the mahant approached and challenged hayat khan the latter saw that he had no warlike weapon and consequently retreated from him scorning to attack a defenceless man the onlookers were amused and said how can that faker contend with a pathan the mahant however continued to challenge hayat khan as when a snake is escaping into its hole it will come forth if its tail be trodden on and attack the aggressor so hayat khan who had been retiring before the mahant now advanced against him goaded by his taunts he aimed a blow of his sword at the mahant which the latter received on his club when lo hayat khan's sword fell to pieces the mahant then addressed him now hold thy ground and defend thyself from me the mahant rose on his stirrups and wielding his club with both hands struck hayat khan with such force on the head that his skull broke and his brains issued forth and stained the battlefield the mahant continued to display his skill and bravery to the pathans but was at last surrounded by them and placed in a very hazardous position when jit mal one of the guru's cousins saw this he rained such a shower of arrows on the pathans that they retreated and left the mahant unmolested he then made his way to the guru and received his approbation ram singh a mechanic from banaras had made a cannon for the guru from which balls were discharged with great effect during this battle people on seeing the impression made on the enemy concluded that the guru was destined to be victorious bakan khan and nijabat khan taunted their men with being unable to cope with a rabble of villagers who did not even know how to handle a martial weapon the result was that the pathans made another desperate effort to brighten their gloomy prospects and for a time caused the guru's army to waver one sahib chand a captain of a troop asked the guru's permission to oppose the onset of the enemy the guru ordered him to act on his own responsibility sahib chand and his men so deftly and rapidly plied their arrows that the pathans found it necessary to take shelter behind trees bhikan khan seeing this addressed his men you are attaching a stigma to the pathan race the hillmen are laughing at you and saying that a faker having killed hyat khan hath put all the pathans to flight saying this bhikan khan set an example of bravery to his soldiers and discharged showers of arrows at the guru's troops sahib chand on the guru's side continued to fight with great determination and caused great havoc among the enemy seeing this hari chand the raja of handur became enraged and strove with equal valour against him his archery was so unerring that the guru's army again wavered sahib chand then occupied himself in warding off hari chand's arrows and inspiriting his men they were not however to be encouraged but were on the point of retreat when the guru heard a great tumult near him he at once ordered nan chand and daya ram to stay the attack of the enemy these brave heroes discharged such showers of arrows as effectually checked the onward progress of the pathans nan chand taking his sword in his hand and putting his horse to full speed rode into the thick of his enemies and chopped off their heads like pumpkins severed from their stalks in his left hand he held a lance with which as occasion served he impaled his antagonists the pathans however retreated not but with their religious battle cry ya ali ya ali firmly held their ground and fell upon nan chand he by his bravery and skill in arms sent every one who approached him to the next world by the way of the sword
a pathan ran his horse forward and received nan chan's sword on his musket the sword fell to pieces and then nan chan drew forth his two-edged dagger daya ram went to his assistance at that critical moment and a hand-to-hand -hand engagement with the moslems ensued in which they were worsted and put to flight raja hari chand still held his ground and was challenged by daya ram hari chand avoided not the conflict but continued to discharge arrows and bullets and inflict great damage on the guru's army his horse was very swift and tractable and he could turn him rapidly round so as to save himself from a hostile attack while at the same time he could discharge fatal missiles at his opponents sayid budu shah was found to have lost during the last charge a second son in the battle there came a confectioner named lal chand to the spot on which the guru stood directing the battle he said i feel greatly tempted to join in the fray but i have never learned how to handle warlike weapons the guru replied if thou desire to fight take and mount a horse the confectioner did so then the guru gave him a sword and shield he inquired how they were to be held the guru told him to take the sword in his right hand and the shield in his left the guru's soldiers laughed at the confectioner's ignorance and said well done our guru and great king wants to kill hawks with sparrows the confectioner ran his horse into the pathan army bakan khan on seeing him said to his friend mir khan see here comes an aurora he hath been all day weighing flour and salt and now the guru hath given him a sword and shield take his arms and his horse and then slay him upon this mir khan pounced on him like a hawk on a sparrow when mir khan drew his sword the confectioner warded it off with his shield then meditating on the guru he aimed a return blow at mir khan which separated his head from his body the hillmen taunted the pathans with not being able to contend with petty hucksters and asked them if they were not ashamed of their cowardice provoked by these taunts nijabat khan and bakan khan urged their men to make a general charge and not die like jackals raja hari chand joined them in their onslaught the guru's brave sikhs however firmly held their ground in the action that ensued jit mal and hari chand engaged in single combat jit mal discharged an arrow at hari chand but the latter by an adroit movement of his horse escaped it jit mal became angry at having missed his mark and discharged another arrow at his opponent hari chand followed his example the arrows lodged in their horses foreheads and both horses fell the combatants thus unhorsed continued to fight until they were both wounded after a short breathing time both again put forward their strength when their swords simultaneously took effect hari chand fell fainting to the earth and jit mal dropped down dead with his face to the foe his comrades blessed the father who had begotten him and the mother who had borne him when the hillmen found that their bravest warrior had fallen into a swoon they assembled to consider what should be done on seeing the enemy huddled together the guru ordered ram singh to direct his cannon towards them ram singh obeyed with the result that several of the enemy were killed on this the rajas of dadwal and jaswal became enraged and actively joined in the battle fatah shah however saw that the day was lost and took to flight the raja of chandel was astonished at the conduct of fatah shah and continued to do valiant battle on behalf of the hill chiefs at the time when jit mal and hari chand were engaged in single combat sango shah the guru's cousin and nijabat khan the pathan leader were similarly employed and both fell by mutual slaughter the guru on seeing the courage and fate of the hero who had performed for him such gallant deeds changed his name from sango to shah sangram lord of battle the guru enraged at his loss mounted his charger and rode into the thick of the combat he so plied his arrows that sounds of woe arose on all sides from the pathan ranks the guru on seeing the renegade bakan khan discharged an arrow at him it missed him but killed his horse upon which he took to flight
nand chand and daya ram now saw an opportunity in the demoralized state of the pathans to make a final desperate charge and complete their discomfiture the result was great slaughter of the treacherous mohammedans when the hillmen saw the total defeat of the pathans they too began to run away from the field of battle raja hari chand who swooned on being wounded by jitmal had by this time recovered and appeared on the scene with the heroic resolution to secure victory for his side he addressed his troops hillmen once so brave why die like cowards i have come to your assistance take courage saying this the rajah stayed the fleeing hosts meanwhile showers of arrows continued to speed from the guru's army rajah hari chand shot many brave men with his own arrows the guru on seeing this confronted him and afterwards thus described the combat that ensued hari chand in his rage drew forth his arrows he struck my steed with one and then discharged another at me but god preserved me and it only grazed my ear in its flight his third arrow penetrated the buckle of my waist-belt and reached my body but wounded me not it is only god who protected me knowing me his servant when i felt the touch of the arrow my anger was kindled i took up my bow and began to discharge arrows in abundance upon this my adversaries began to flee i took aim and killed the young chief hari chand when he perished my heroes trampled their enemies under foot the chief of korori was seized by death upon this the hillmen fled in consternation and i through the favour of the eternal god gained the victory having thus held the battlefield we raised aloud the song of triumph i showered wealth on my warriors and they all rejoiced raja fatah shah saw there was only safety in flight and hastened to retire to his capital praises of the guru's valour and skill in warfare were sung throughout the country End of section five. Section six of Sikh Religion, Volume Five by Max Arthur McAuliffe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It's the life of Guru Gobind Singh. Chapter six after the battle the guru went to where lay the bodies of sango shah jitmal and his other brave fallen sikhs he ordered the slain on both sides to be disposed of the bodies of the sikhs were cremated of the hindus thrown into the adjacent river and of the mussulmans buried with all solemnity bards assembled and chanted their praises Sayyid budu shah presented himself and his two surviving sons to the guru the guru said i hail thee as a true priest of god thy human life is profitable unto thee deem not that thy sons are dead nay they shall live for ever only those die who despise god's name and turn cowards on the field of battle budu shah replied true king i mourn not for my sons who are slain because in the first place they have gone to enjoy seats in paradise and secondly because they have lost their lives in defence of thee such a boon is not obtained even by the greatest austerities the guru considered how he should requite budu shah for his supreme devotion to his cause he decided that as worldly possessions were fleeting the gift of god's name was the highest reward of all and so that inestimable boon he duly conferred on him but he made him other gifts also the guru at the time was combing his long hair and a servant stood by holding his turban when the guru had performed his toilet he laid his comb with loose hair in it upon the turban and presented them to budu shah to preserve in remembrance of him he also gave him a small knife which sikhs usually carry and finally a sum of five thousand rupees to distribute among his disciples the guru's turban his comb hair and knife are preserved as relics in the sikh state of nabha they were acquired from budu shah's descendants by raja barpur singh 
the guru remembered his cousins sango shah and jitmal and proclaimed them brave and puissant warriors who had taken their seats in heaven he bade their brothers not mourn for them the brothers replied for whom should we mourn sango shah and jitmal have fought and obtained the dignity of salvation war means either to kill or be killed and there is no need to mourn the consequences the guru rewarded all those who had risked their lives for him and contributed to his signal and decisive victory when the guru's fame extended after his recent success and prowess in arms he was visited by many accomplished persons poets singers and musicians flocked to his court and all who visited him he endeavoured to suitably reward now that the war was over the sikh soldiers formed various projects to occupy their time for the future they would go and seize raja fatah shah and make him bow at the guru's feet and they would conquer and obtain the freedom of the country between panta and anandpur so as to remove the obstacles interposed in marching hither and thither this last enterprise as being the one that affected them most closely they specially urged on the guru's consideration the guru remonstrated and restrained them he bade them bide their opportunity their empire should yet extend far and wide he knew however that his troops would not sit down idle flushed as they were with their recent victory accordingly he gave them an order to return to anandpur an order with which they were delighted they all set forth accordingly taking their wounded and their baggage the guru marched by way of sadhara and laharpur he encamped at the latter place and was there met by the envoy of the raja of nahan who desired to come to meet him the guru sent his army to anandpur and remained himself with only a few followers to meet the raja the guru was fain to divert himself with the chase after his recent warfare and ample opportunities were afforded him in that part of the country during his stay in laharpur budu shah often visited him and held religious conversations with him though the raja of nahan very much desired to entertain the guru yet he apprehended the wrath of the other hill chiefs if he were known to be still on amicable terms with the high priest of the sikhs who had inflicted on them such a signal defeat the raja used to send a messenger daily to say that he was coming but somehow he was accidentally prevented he would however come on the morrow the raja carried on this method of procrastination from day to day at last he asked the advice of his ministers whether it was proper for him to meet the guru or not they advised him that it was not seeing that the guru was at enmity with all the hill chiefs were he now to meet the guru the chiefs would resent it and probably make war on him on this the raja sent a messenger to say he was very busy and could not go himself to meet the guru but he would send his chief minister to do him the honours of the state the guru did not conceal his knowledge of the raja's motives and sent him a message that he would now continue his journey to anandpur and the raja need not give himself any further concern on the subject of an interview the guru stayed altogether thirteen days at laharpur the principal inhabitants were rangars thieves by instinct and profession who stole two of his camels when the rangars refused to give up the booty the guru sent for a fakir who lived near and told him to go under pretence of begging to the house of a certain rangar and see whether the camels were there the fakir went saw the camels and duly reported his discovery the guru sent for the rangar in possession and told him to act as an honest man and give up the camels otherwise he would oust him from house and home on this the rangar parted with the stolen property the guru called the rangar's village counterfeit 
and the fakir's village genuine and said the fakir's village should ever gain and the rangars ever lose the prophecy of the guru has been fulfilled a temple called toka was subsequently constructed in laharpur in honour of the guru's visit as the guru proceeded to anandpur he was met by the rani of raipur who waited for him on his route after making her obeisance she asked him to take rest at her capital the guru gladly accepted her invitation she showed him the greatest hospitality and sent her son to him with an offering of a bag of rupees at a subsequent interview she entreated the guru to pray that her son's line might permanently endure the guru said that her son ought to allow his hair to grow and perfect himself in the practice of arms the rani replied that the turks were in power and she was afraid to allow her son to dress differently from them the guru exhorted her not to be afraid the rule of the turks should only last for a brief period when my sect groweth more numerous and obtaineth possession of the empire of the turks it shall then adopt long hair as a distinction and when the line of the turks is extirpated thine shall remain in undiminished dignity it shall then unite with the khalsa and obtain all happiness upon this the guru took his sword and shield and presented them to the rani's son he said take them and treat them with respect so that when the time of trouble ariseth thy wishes may be fulfilled and thy life and property preserved the rani was delighted with the guru's presence and words and thus addressed him great king great are thy gifts who can deprive us of them it is thy unswerving duty to hold thyself bound by the bonds of love for the human race and thou art moreover merciful and compassionate the rani seeing that the guru had made the gift with his own sacred hands was filled with delight and taking the sword and shield put them respectfully on her head and then touched her son's head with them she bound a coverlet on a couch and placed the weapons reverently on it after this the guru continued his journey to anandpur on the way the guru halted at karatpur where gulab ray and sham das the grandsons of guru har gobind came to visit him he there visited the shrines of his ancestors when it became known that the guru was returning to anandpur the inhabitants of that city came forth to receive him and there were unusual rejoicings on his safe and glorious return not long afterwards complaints began to be made against the guru's troops to raja bim chand whenever the guru's men did not accompany him to the chase they used to go hunting in detached groups by themselves the guru at that time set about the construction of a fort and made a strong and lofty battlement around it raja bim chand was greatly irritated by the numerous complaints he continually received against the sikhs he took counsel with his minister what shall we do we are not strong enough to contend with the guru but how long are we to endure this annoyance the minister replied o raja i see no solution of the difficulty except reconciliation with the guru all the other principal state officers who were consulted gave similar replies bim chand then decided that he would send an envoy to ascertain if the guru had any intention of making an abiding peace with him the envoy who was selected from the most polished officials of the state duly delivered his master's message praying for peace and forgetfulness of the past the guru replied i have not fallen out with raja bim chand but he hath fallen out with me see what deceit he exercised in his efforts to obtain my elephant when his marriage procession went to srinagar he endeavoured to kill my minister and his troops it was only by god's special favour they escaped even then thy raja left nothing undone against us for he incited fatah shah who had been my friend to make war on us here again god protected us and we obtained the victory o envoy 
our army hath taken possession of no fort or village of yours my troopers are grievously in want of grass for their horses and goats flesh for themselves these can only be obtained from your villages if we do not obtain them on payment we must starve but we do not desire to accept anything else from you the envoy smiled and said consider raja bim chand's country as thine own he is very anxious to meet thee and if thou permit me i will conduct him here the guru replied in guru nanak's house men meet their deserts if any one with lowly mind enter therein he shall be happy but if any one lifting his head too high enter it his life shall pay the forfeit then plainly tell thy raja that if he entertain friendly intent he may come to me and he shall be received with due consideration the raja was very pleased on receiving this message and at once made elaborate preparations for his visit to the guru when bim chand was introduced into the guru's presence he said o oh, true guru thy name is cherisher of those who seek thy protection i pray thee to pardon and forget any foolish words i might have uttered or any foolish acts i might have done the guru replied o oh, raja i have not been thine aggressor the aggression hath been all on thy side if thou act fairly towards the guru he will act fairly towards thee bim chand promised to act for the future according to the guru's wishes upon this the guru gave him a magnificent robe of honour and dismissed him highly delighted with the interview the guru's wife sundari now presented him with a son named ajit singh on the fourth day of the bright half of mag sambat seventeen forty three a d sixteen eighty seven end of chapter six